the midrash that exists exists from the old rabbis and the Talmud and the like these old documents, everybody feels real comfortable disagreeing with each other. It's fascinating. You just see you just see all these. Well, I think this passage means this. I think this passage means this. Oh, I agree with this person. I disagree with this person. It's like the texts themselves are having a conversation that's holding space for all those different perspectives. And that's just not what a lot of us have been exposed to. Hello and welcome to Deconstructing the Bible. My name is Jason Steffenhagen. I'm the Associate Minister at The Well, United Methodist Church in Rosemont, Minnesota. And this is part two of my conversation with Stephanie Spencer, the leader and director of 40 Orchards. She's an artist, a scripture teacher, an Enneagram coach, and she's helping us dive deeper into why it is important to explore the scriptures, ask good questions, wrestle with the text, just like has been done for centuries. And so enjoy part two of our conversation. So let me ask you this question, Stephanie. Why aren't you uncomfortable with that? Because I I would imagine, even even in my own life, if someone were to say, oh yeah, somebody interprets it this way and someone interprets it this way and someone thinks it's this and they don't all, they don't all, they don't agree. I would suddenly find myself getting like, like closing up and being like, I don't even know what to think then. I don't know. Like, tell me what I'm, what is the right answer? Which one of these rabbis was correct? Which one had the right idea? Why aren't you, why are you so comfortable with that? Well, maybe even to the question you asked recently, I don't see Jesus getting uncomfortable with that. Mm. I see Jesus you know, having amongst his disciples, zealots and fishermen and like a tax Tax collector who seems to be very well versed in scripture because he writes the best uh, Old Testament resource in the gospels in the book of Matthew. So there's a way that like that collection of a diversity of voices seems to actually be normal. Mm. Um, I also think it, it goes back to that, how do we read it question of what do we think the purpose of reading the Bible is? And we tend to read with theology first, instead of theology as an open-ended possibility, meaning we're very mm. afraid of kicking at tires that will disrupt the whole. We're very afraid of things that could be heresy. And we tend to bring that fear into how we read and don't wonder, well, like, what's the worst that can happen if I start holding this passage a little differently. And when I see people who are really afraid of opening up and disagreement, it's the Pharisees, which is what who Jesus speaks yeah. against about the most. The Pharisees had a set list of this is what the law means. This is how you read it. If everybody follows our one solid plan, believes this, follows this, everything will be okay. And that's the thing over and over again. Jesus says, no, that's not how you read it. Yeah. Those are the folks getting it wrong because it doesn't have a, an ability to move with time and space and people. Yeah. And, and, he so, gets, and he gets at that when he says, you even tithe mint, dill, and cumin, but you've forgotten the weightier matters of the law, love and justice, right? Mm-hmm. And and I, I think that that moment is so powerful because when we're in a position of power and authority, we can create a system, we can create expectations to the point where we are making the smallest parts of our ministry or the smallest parts of our community very exacting, right? Like tithing mint, dill, and cumin, some of the smallest things out there. But we forget, because we're protecting our power, we forget to look out for those in the margins or those that are oppressed by the system, even the very system that we've created. And so I think for Christians, it's really easy for us to fall into the same trap that the Pharisees did, that, yeah, we want to follow the law and do the right things. But when doing the right things becomes more important than loving, we, we start creating a, a system of power that we end up defending as opposed to recognizing that our power is meant to be given away where we invite the voice of those on the margins. We invite the voice of those who might need to enlighten us into what's going on. And so, yeah, I think Jesus constantly points that out, like you said, to the Pharisees in so many different ways. I'm always a big fan of asking questions and asking the next question. And so I I think the next question of like, well, what if, what if this like kicks at the wrong things or aren't you afraid of that to then ask, well, why are you afraid of that? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we're afraid of that because we think that getting a belief wrong will kick us out. Mm -hmm. Why do we think we'll be kicked out? Mm -hmm. What do we think it takes to belong? What do we think the character of God is like? 
Yeah. Like behind those questions are, and how we hold the Bible tends to be fears about whether we actually believe God is good and mm. gracious and loving. Mm. Um, because there's something in us often that's afraid of getting something wrong to the point where we won't ask the dangerous questions because we're afraid of where that will take us. Yeah. Well, at the same time, saying like singing songs and saying that we believe God is good. Well, this is a, would a good God kick us out for asking a question? Mm -hmm. Would a good father punish a child for wrestling with something? Right. And I think that's a part of the story that came before. And we tend to spend a lot of time in the Old Testament as we see that Israel, like the names matter as part of how we study is we'll say, let's translate yeah. names, not just transliterate names. Mm -hmm. So when we think about the people being called the children of Israel, Israel gets his name in Genesis 32 by wrestling with this man, angel, God figure along the side of a river because the Jacob has struggled with his identity his whole life. And so he's at this threshold and he wrestles and wrestles and wrestles at this threshold because he's about to see his brother again and he's going to step back into some things that he left behind. So let me, let me just pause and give some context for those that have no idea what you're talking about. So there's Abraham, his son is Isaac, and then Isaac has twins, Jacob and Esau. Esau is the older one, but Jacob steals his birthright. And then in stealing the birthright or the inheritance, he runs away and he's gone for years, at least 14 years, maybe even longer. And now he's finally taking the courageous step to cross the river back into his family's land. He's going to confront his brother Esau for the first time since stealing his birthright. But on the verge of crossing the river, he has this moment of wrestling with, like what Stephanie said, this angel, God, man, person. And he's demanding a blessing, which is what he stole from Esau. I mean, you and I have actually had a scripture circle about this, and it was amazing to talk about. But he stole a blessing, and now here he is wrestling with God, demanding a new blessing. And in that process, they have this great wrestling match. And so then, Stephanie, now tell us what happens. Yeah, so in that wrestling match, that man-angel God figure then says, well, what is your name? And he says, my name is Jacob. Mm -hmm. And and then his reward for finally for saying his name is that the figure says, your name will no longer be Jacob, it will be Israel, for you have um, had power or wrestled with man and God and have prevailed. Mm -hmm. So Israel's name means one who wrestles with God and with humans and is able. I love that. I and, love that. And to think that this is then the name given to people of faith. That and the other name given to people of faith is Hebrews. Mm -hmm. Hebrew, it comes from the Hebrew word, again, if we translate it, it's from Ivri, which means to cross over. Mm. So the name in the Old Testament narrative, people of faith are called God wrestlers and crossoverers. <laughs> people in transformation, people that are going through something. Process. Process, yes. And to say, okay, Interesting that they're not called people of certainty, people of mm. uh, doctrine, people of like, how would we define people of faith today? What do we use to define whether someone is in or out? And I mean, they, they, they don't, they're not even called righteous, right? Their name isn't no. the righteous ones or the perfect ones or the, mm. or the just ones. Like they're the processors. They're the, they're the wrestlers. They're the doubters. You could probably even say they're the question askers. Because yeah. what's in, what makes you in, if you want to have an in and out, is wrestling. Mm -hmm. Because then you're engaged. You're If you are engaged in this transformative process with God, that is the mark of faith. Sometimes engagement looks like, you know, praising. But sometimes engagement looks like getting, like, the word for wrestling in that passage in Genesis 32 is actually, like, the. it comes from the idea of getting dirty. Like, being down in the dirt. Yeah. That's sometimes what it looks like to engage. So let's engage. Right. Well, and I love that that imagery. And so I guess in a way we're doing a little midrash with this, right? Like, how do you read it? And what does it make you feel? And how, you know, what are you thinking about it? Because if I think about that idea of getting down in the dirt and getting dirty and wrestling with something, that's not always fun. And sometimes the dirt is where there's pain and there's uh, I have to strip away all that I'm trying to hold up as perfect. That that can be hard sometimes. It can be painful. It can be a loss of identity, or it can be maybe pulling away a false identity to actually get down to the real one. And then it also made me instantly remember 
the moment that you talked about the Bible coming alive for the first time was in a season where things weren't perfect and you were drawn to the scriptures and reading a psalm every night. And so there's something transformational, transformational about those hard moments and about getting in the mud or about being in the mud or being in a hard space um, that it, it, it draws you into the possibility of transformation if you're willing to get down there and actually do it or go mm-hmm. through it. Mm-hmm. And then, I mean, I love what you said there because the, the name of the river that he's by is the River Yabuk which when we're looking at the Hebrew is also fascinating because there's this whole play on the Jacob's name because his name is Yabuk. And it's so the river is sort of related to his name, but it's also, it means emptying. Mm. So he's wrestling at the threshold of emptying and he's by himself and he gets this name of God wrestler. And then he crosses over, becomes a Hebrew mm. to meet his brother again and to move towards reconciliation and to move towards living into this future blessing that he is meant to live into, but had a whole roundabout messy story to get there. I mean, it's almost like you could say the story of Israel, the name Israel, the person Jacob who becomes Israel, the story of us as humans is a journey towards maturity. And it requires being willing to strip it away, being willing to question, being willing to wrestle, being willing to be self-emptied so that there's room to be poured into, room to be filled up so that we can start to see things with love and justice and generosity and hospitality and become the type of people that, that, that work with God, right? And, 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 and sometimes wrestle with God and continue to do so but that we are now participating in this new way of being, but it takes all of these steps. And and those aren't steps towards something negative. They're actually steps towards maturity. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing now, I would say is like a a key part of what happens in scripture circles or this idea of Midrash is we're saying, these are stories of the human experience. The story of Jacob is our story. So this is what sometimes happens when we, sometimes those conversations about historical context have just made it Jacob's story. Yes. And there's a way of saying, yes, it's Jacob's story, but also the Bible's full of archetypes. There, yeah. It's full of humans who have had experiences that are our experiences, that are things that are paralleled within the text. They happen over and over again. And then in our lives, they happen over and over again. And we can find ourselves there and we can find comfort and direction and discernment when we look at the stories that way and say, oh my gosh, yeah, I've been by that river. Yeah. But I don't feel like I prevailed. I think I went back. Right. Or, okay, let's try again. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And and you asked the question, you know, have you ever been by a river like that? Have you ever been in a time of wrestling and questioning and doubting? And you've ever felt like the direction that you're about to go is completely foreign to where, to who you've been all your life? You know, and and then and then asking the question, how does that make you feel? What 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 rises up in you? Do you want to retreat? Do you want to run? Do you think that God is really partnering with you, or do you think that God has left you? Like all these different questions and feelings and emotions arise because it's not just Jacob's story, like you said, it's our story, like you said, right? Like we right. are we are Jacob in that moment. We are Israel, and and that's where like I love. I think it's Rob Bell who talks about. The Bible is a book about what it means to be human. And I would say like human in relationship to God, ourselves, others, and creation, that idea of shalom, this, this right relationship with kind of on every level. And so, um, yeah, what does it mean to be human in relationship to God as we are moving through this life? Um, and I think that's what the Bible is truly speaking to. It's not just doctrines. It's not just rules. It's not just the answer book. And it's not just a history book or a scientific textbook. It's something much more dynamic if we allow it to, to breathe. And if we learn how to study, you know, like you're, you're giving a gift by like defining the name Jacob, defining the name Israel, defining the name of this river and attaching context to all of that. I mean, that's not something that we normally just sit around and like open our Bibles and read on a random Tuesday morning is like, oh, Israel. Yes, I know exactly what that means. We just think it's the name of a country or a person, but it's not. It, it's, so, it's so much deeper than that. Mm-hmm. And those translations, I mean, translators aren't being intentionally bad either. It's just right. that all translation is commentary. And that's one of the things we talk about mm. is like, is actually recognizing so much of what we do as commentary. We just don't recognize it as such. So translators having to take an ancient Eastern language and make it into 
a modern Western reader's like ability to understand it. And that doesn't happen. I mean, and anybody who knows another language, right? How easy is it? Sometimes you run across a word in Spanish where you can't really translate it in English. It's not, it doesn't have a parallel or it doesn't sound the same or roll off the tongue in the same way. It's really natural to miss some of those things. So to just slow down yeah. And to say, okay, let's look at this word by word. Let's think about, and, and the, the language functions so differently too, because Hebrew is a verb-based language. So all the all of the nouns go back to verb, like three-letter root verbs, mm. which means there's this sort of flowing activeness to it. And those root verbs, by their nature of how Hebrew functions, mean multiple things. So right. a translation into English has to make it, has to pick one of those words. Right. But in Hebrew, you'd be able to hold all of the words because you would know it means multiple things. No one would have to tell you that it means multiple things. You would know that and you would sort of feel that differently than we feel it. So a good part of what we're doing, we're translating and we're also just like slowing down. Yes. Saying, all right. For instance, a really good example of that is the word Shema. Mm -hmm. Jesus quotes the Shema um, of Hero yeah, Israel, the Lord your God, Deuteronomy 6.4. Six, six, yep. Well, the word here, Shema, it also means obey. It's used a lot in the book of Deuteronomy. Most of the time it's translated as obey. Do we read those verses differently when we translate them as here? The word obey a lot of times has hooks for us and we hear it a particular way. Now it's connected to the word here for a reason, because like I have kids, there's a, they're not all hearing is the same hearing, <laughs> right? I, I know if they heard me, if they follow through on something yes. I've asked of them. And so ultimately obeying is hearing, but actually hearing is a better word to start with because hearing makes that a very relational word. It's a yeah. very obeying isn't about me dictating to you and you following the rules. It's have I listened to the guiding force that loves me? And in that listening, am I following through on what I have heard? I love that you said it's inviting. Oh, I love that word. It's inviting you into the relationship as opposed to you taking a subservient role in this dynamic, which would be so important understanding where that Deuteronomy passages is, is coming out of. It's coming out of people that are getting that instruction, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6, right? Hero is the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul and strength. They're coming after 400 years of slavery where obeying was not hearing or listening it was simply doing. There was, there was no humanness to their obedience because they were slaves. And so now God is inviting them to hear and to listen. But the expectation is that you participate and that you do get to work and that you do obey. But there's an invitation to that. I love that so much. Hmm. And quoting that makes me think of another sort of like why Christians might do this or why I might feel comfortable with it. Because there's this... A subtle thing that happens in Mark 12, where Jesus is in this conversation with the scribe about what is the greatest commandment. The same conversation he was having um, in Luke 10 that led to the parable of the Good Samaritan. But in this case, it's somebody who has a better question. And it's interesting to notice when Jesus answers a question with an answer, mm -hmm. when Jesus answers a question with a question, and when Jesus answers with a parable, and what's going on in the asker of the question for how Jesus responds. So this seems to be a good question. He's asking, what's the first commandment? What's the protos? And mm. so in Greek, protos means first, like it can mean first in numerical order, but it also means source. Mm. So this is a scribe who has written and rewritten and rewritten all of the laws. Tell me, Jesus, what is the beginning? What is the source? What is the first? What is core? Yeah. in all of what's come before yeah and what's Jesus, the what i love the idea like i i can't remember the the writer who says this but like what is the ground of this whole thing like what yes. holds this all up right what's the source i love that and they have the conversation about the shema and the hero israel and then jesus says i should i should make sure i get this right for how he says it because as we compare to what you were just saying in the Shema, we sometimes miss this because we don't read Deuteronomy alongside Mark 12. Whereas the here, a scribe would hear this because they know, De they know Deuteronomy 6. They've written Deuteronomy 6 in the scroll. They would hear something that Jesus does here that we don't tend to hear. So Jesus answered in the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, soul, 
mind, and strength. This is the first, this is the Protos commandment. If we read that in Deuteronomy 6, which is clearly what he is quoting, <clears throat> thou shalt love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, and your might. Yeah, mind was left out. Wait a second, Jesus. You just added a word to the Torah. What's going on there? <laughs> Context has changed. So Jesus is talking to a Greek audience. Deuteronomy is talking to a Hebrew audience. In a Hebrew audience, the lev is your heart, and your heart is the seat of your decision making. So your heart, the seat of your decision making is therefore in control of both your emotions and your mind, because you make decisions from both. So it is one word for both things. Yes, lev. it's heart and mind. Love the, love the Lord yes. your God with all of your love, all of your soul, nefesh, and all of your strength, moed. Or might or greatness is actually a better, good word for that. When we get to the Greek time period, mind, like we're, we're starting to struggle with Gnosticism at this point. This, there's a separateness of spirit. There's a separateness of mind as well. And Plato and others have actually said that like mind is actually the highest God. Mm. Like your mind your, is, is the most important thing about you. It's the most important thing. Of, that's all of these intellectual, all of this birthplace of philosophy. They yeah. love their minds. And they view the mind very separate from the heart. And the mind is actually more important than the heart. So if Jesus had quoted Deuteronomy 6 directly to a Greek audience, they would have missed what the verse was actually saying. If he would have said, love the Lord with all your God, with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, Greek audiences would have been like, great, my mind is free to just go talk Plato. Right, right. Or they would have just dismissed him altogether and said, he doesn't know what he's talking about because he didn't mention the mind, which we all know is the highest form of intellectualism and, and, and the highest form of what it means to be human. So this Jesus guy doesn't need to be listened to. He includes it, which then we could say either Jesus doesn't know the Bible very well, which we, I think we doubt is true, and he's misquoting it by accident, or he intentionally adds that word because it matters for the context of the conversation and who he's yeah. speaking to. In which case, we could actually say Jesus is practicing, practicing Midrash with Deuteronomy yes. 6, 5, and 4 and 5, these very important verses, and saying, as we have this conversation now, it's important that we talk about the mind because yes. that's included in these verses. It's implied in these verses, but let's talk about it here. And these verses aren't just like kind of important verses. These are like the two verses in the, in the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament that they are instructed to write on their doorposts. They are instructed to carry them with them, to teach their children, to say before they leave their home, say when they are walking on the street, say when they enter their home. I mean, it is so impactful to this community that it's, it's kind of like John 3.16 to most evangelical Christians. Like the first verse that you memorize is John 3.16, so you can learn about salvation. Um, the first thing you would have taught a, a young Jewish child would have been the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6. You would have taught them that instantly. And, and part of the evidence for that, and this is just my own fun anecdotal evidence, when my sister-in-law and brother-in-law moved into their home in Memphis, there was something attached to their door frame, and they had no idea what it was. They unscrewed it. They opened it up, and guess what it was? It was a scroll of the Shema because the previous owners were a Jewish couple that literally took this verse and put it on their door frame, just like it says to do in Deuteronomy. So it's this still would have a commonly so practiced primary. thing. It's called a mezuzah and you can buy them all over in, um, uh, in Israel. It's, you put a mezuzah near your door and you yes. have a little scroll with Deuteronomy 6, 4 inside of it. So this would have been things that every single person at that time and still to this day would have known like the back of their hand, like the first thing they would have ever memorized, they would have said it every day. And so here Jesus is adding to it, tweaking it. I mean, this could have either been the most revolutionary, amazing idea or the most offensive idea in Israelite history. <laughs> Right. And we can sort of then ask his own question back to him. How is he reading it? What is he showing us about how mm -hmm. he is holding the scriptures? Yeah. 
and and what that oh it, there's something different than quoting it directly there's something to understanding the core of what is being said yeah. and appropriately translating that forward to our context so that we understand the core of it that's different than quoting it so like if we're taking this now a step further and putting it into our own context which is what a good midrash would want to do one way that i would put it is so we have this this Hebrew understanding of the Shema, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, that the, the, the place where you discern things, right? Heart, mind, passions, emotions, all of it, as well as your soul and as well as all of your strength or your greatness. Then Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He adds to it. And I think what, what we're getting at here is you could almost summarize it by saying with the fullness of your being, with everything that makes you, you, your strength, your soul, your heart, your mind. And now in our context today, in the 21st century, where we have taken the human being and we have like pulled the human being apart into all of these different layers, basically I, what you could potentially do is say, take every single thing that identifies you, your sexuality, your gender, your, you know, um, your occupation, every single thing that you get an, an identity from, that should be used towards love. Like all of that should be used towards loving God. And then like the second commandment, loving others. And so there isn't a single part of you that you get to leave on the shelf. Just like the Greeks weren't able to leave their mind on the shelf over here to use for whatever they wanted. The entirety of your being is to be put to use for love. That's how I would like take it to our, our context today. And then, and to say, gosh, and that starts with hearing. Right. We like like the love actually then begins in both cases. What doesn't shift is that love begins with hearing. And how do we position ourselves to hear and therefore position ourselves to love with all mm. of who we are and to love wow. God in this way and then to love our neighbor as ourselves and to say this is the protos, this is the core of who we're meant to be, just as the people heard that. Um, in Deuteronomy, as they were about to cross over into the promised land from the wilderness. So Deuteronomy's context is a group of people who have been living on manna for 40 years, who are about to have pomegranates for the first time, <laughs> and who are about to fight battles and look for a place and settle. And they're being instructed to hear and to love. And they're being reminded of what justice looks like and go live in this way, in this land you are headed to. And how can we keep doing that? How can we yeah. keep living, like thinking about how to love in the new context as we cross to new contexts? Oof. Which goes all the way back to the name of Israel, mm -hmm. crossing the river into a new context with a new name, with an invitation to participate in the process and to always be in motion. And here it is in the Shema. Here it is in Jesus. And here we are today still doing the same thing, asking the question, what does it mean to be human right now? How are we holding our power? How are we creating room for our own listening, whether it's listening to the spirit, listening to the word of God, or listening to the voice of those on the margins who are often voiceless in our communities? And how can we create room to hear from them how the systems are working or not working, how the way in which we've structured things is working or not working. And are we really doing that? What, you know, there's, there's a challenge in that to, to, to us today that is coming straight from the New Testament and straight from the Hebrew scriptures. Wraps up part two of my conversation with Stephanie Spencer, the leader of 40 Orchards. And I'm excited to invite you back next week as we conclude our conversation with part three, where we're going to be exploring even further what it means to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourself. So thank you for joining us. We look forward to continuing the conversation on Deconstructing the Bible next week. Thanks.